Natural selection. Let's talk about what it is and how Darwin came to formulate his theory. Just prior to, Lam uh, prior to Darwin, there was a gentleman called Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, who was a French naturalist. And he proposed a theory which, to all intents and purposes, has been debunked. Um, actually, if you go to Varsity now and you study this, his theory actually does hold some merit in a field of science called epigenetics. Uh, however, for the purposes of your high school curriculum, his theories have been debunked. He had two laws, the law of use and disuse and the law of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Essentially what he said was that if you have an organism that uses a particular organ, that organ will increase in size. If you do not use an organ, it will decrease in size. So we have these examples in the fossil record of giraffes or giraffe-like animals with very short necks. Now, if you think of the Akapi uh, of modern day, which is very similar. This is the copy up here. Um, that's very similar. And over time, we see that giraffe's necks get longer and longer in the fossil record. How did that come to be? Uh, Lamarck said that obviously the short giraffes down here were stretching and stretching and stretching their necks to try and reach these leaves. And because they were using their necks frequently, their necks got longer. As their necks got longer, his second law uh, is that those long those with the longer necks then passed on those acquired characteristics to their children now an acquired characteristic is something that you get during your lifetime so you stretch and stretch and stretch your neck and your neck gets longer during your lifetime that is an acquired characteristic which then you pass on to your children now the ridiculous example that i use to explain why this doesn't work in most situations imagine that you're involved in a car accident and your arm is cut off that is an acquired characteristic. So then, if you have children after that accident, your children should be born with no arms or no arm on that particular side because that acquired characteristic should then be passed on to your offspring. At a ridiculous level, that was exactly what Lamarck was saying. So his two laws, the law of use and disuse, if you use something, it gets bigger. If you don't use it, it gets smaller. And his law of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, characteristics that you inherit or characteristics that you develop during your life are inherited by your children. Okay, so there's a, a summary of that. What is important to notice here is that this Lamarck's law is driven by an inner need. We call that self-determination. And it is this self-determination that giraffe wants to have a longer neck to be able to reach the leaves on the tree. Uh, that characterizes what we call Lamarckian evolution. Then comes Darwin. Uh, Darwin did this fantastic trip all around the world. Uh, he was on the HMS Beagle and he collected an unbelievable amount of samples. In fact, even today, so this was in the 1800s, even today there are still several ca casks of samples that he took that scientists have not yet looked at and have not yet classified or, or dealt with. So, I mean, he collected an incredible amount of stuff. In his journey, so his journey took him four years, in his journey around the world on this uh, HMS Beagle, he came up with, or he observed, these four things. Firstly, organisms produce a large number of offspring. Those offspring already show a great deal of variation. And of the large number of offspring that are produced, very few survive to adulthood and to reproduce themselves. What he also noticed is that characteristics are inherited from parents that survive. So if you survive and reproduce, you will pass on your characteristics to your offspring. Those four observations are essentially what underpin the theory of natural selection. So natural selection. Okay, here are the observations that Darwin had. Organisms produce a large number of offspring, great deal of variation. Now, as a result of that, some organisms will have favorable characteristics. If you have a favorable characteristic, then it will give you an advantage. If you do not have a favorable characteristic, you will not have that advantage. If there is a change in the environment, and this is where natural selection comes in, it's when there is a change in the environment. That can result in, for example, increased competition. If there is a change in the increased competition, then organisms that have characteristics that make them better suited will survive. Those organisms that have characteristics that make them less suited 
will not survive. Notice these characteristics are the ones that you are, sorry, going back, that you are already born with. Okay, the variation that already exists amongst the offspring. Now, as, sorry, going back. So, if you survive, then you will reproduce. And if you reproduce, you will pass on these favorable characteristics that you have to your offspring. That is natural selection. Now, when we expand that over multiple generations, eventually what happens is that the changes occurring in the population may lead to the formation of a new species. In other words, macroevolution occurs. Okay, so when we have these um, individuals with favorable characteristics, and those favorable characteristics, remember, could result from mutations, they could result from random meiosis, they could result from all kinds of things. If you have the favorable characteristic and the frequency of that favorable characteristic increases in the population, then that may lead to the formation of a new species. Macroevolution can occur. Okay, let's have a look at an example of Darwin versus Lamarck and try and work out which is which. So if you have a look at these two photos, here we have two different birds, the great blue heron and the snowy egret. Both of these birds are waders, which means that they walk around in water and they fish uh, in water for fish or frogs or worms or whatever they can find. Now, if we assume that the ancestral species for both of these had short legs and therefore could only walk around in very shallow water, eating snails and small fish, how did we end up with these birds that have such incredibly long legs that allows them to walk around in much deeper water? Okay, so I'm going to show you two scenarios and you need to try and figure out which one is Lamarck and which one is Darwin. Okay, so here are your two scenarios. I'll give you a moment to read that. Pause the video now to be able to read this and then press play when you're done. Is which? What we're looking for is keywords. So we've got a change in the environment, therefore that increased competition. Okay, so the moment you see those things, that should tell you something about it. Okay, so there's a depletion now, if we have a look, a depletion of the food supply. What does that mean? That means that there's going to be increased competition. As a result, what happened? They were then forced, okay, so they needed to wade deeper in order to survive, which forced them to stretch their legs. Okay, notice the them, to stretch their legs. Why? Because they didn't want to get knocked over. Then, as a result of that, this stretching caused their legs to get longer. There is a change in a characteristic. In other words, something is being acquired at that point in time. Okay, so when these birds produced hatchlings, the babies grew up with slightly longer legs inherited from their parents. So we've now got slightly longer legs inherited. Okay. These offspring needed to wade out even further, so they stretched their legs even more, which made them a little bit longer yet. And in turn, their hatchlings grew up with even longer legs, and so on. Okay, what do you think? Is this Lamarck, or is this Darwin? This is, quite clearly, Lamarck. Notice that we've got Self-determination, they didn't want, they're they. We've got an acquired characteristic. Okay, Those two things, that is about use and disuse. Their legs are getting longer and longer and longer. And it's about the law of acquired characteristics. I can't fit it in. Anyway. If we look now at scenario B, okay, we've got the same thing. Um, so now we've got, with the species, there is already, so they're short-legged, but there's already a range of leg lengths. 
In other words, if you put these two together, you've already got variation already exists in the population. Okay, And that variation is from a bit shorter to a little bit longer. The legs tended to run in families, in other words, it's hereditary. Okay, so then we've got the same thing here. Change in the environment increases competition. Because there's already variation, the birds that already have the slightly longer legs can wade out further. As a result of that, they obtained more food, they lived longer, and therefore produced more hatchlings. Those with the shorter legs would tend to starve to death. In other words, they're not going to pass on their genes. After many generations, the average leg length was much longer. So this very clearly here is Darwin. Did you get that? I hope so. Now, when we look at this in modern day, uh, there are a number of examples here. So we now know that there are a whole breed of mice that are immune to warfarin. Warfarin is a mouse poison. Um, you may be familiar with warfarin as a blood thinner. That's how it works. Uh, when you feed warfarin to mice because their bodies are so small, they eat so much of it, and essentially all of their blood vessels leak and they hemorrhage, they die. Uh, bed bugs, hotels these days have a real problem with bed bugs because the bed bugs are immune to most of the pesticides that we have. Elephants, uh, as a result of poaching that has occurred. Um, so I need to say, tuskless elephants uh, is a natural phenomenon. You would probably have found in the past that one out of every hundred elephants that was born was tuskless. Now we're finding that maybe 10 out of every 100 that are born are tuskless. There is an advantage to being tuskless, and that is that if you don't have tusks, poachers won't be interested in you. Uh, the purpose of tusks is to dig for water and to push trees over so that you can eat. So there have to be some tusked individuals in the population. But if you've got one or two tusked individuals in the population, the rest of them could be tuskless and they will all survive. Um, so there is a selective advantage in being tuskless in the current day and age. And then the twitching lizards, I won't show you that video now. Uh, essentially, there were two species of li lizards. The one species of lizard freezes when it's attacked by ants. That's a normal predatory response to freeze and pretend that you don't exist. The other species actually starts twitching and dancing and shaking the ants off. The problem with these ants is that when they bite the lizards, they inject poison into it, which kills the lizard. So sitting still is no longer an advantage. Now that there are these ants that can bite uh, and inject poison into the lizards in this environment. Being a twitching lizard is an advantage and therefore those that twitch are more likely to survive and they will then reproduce and pass on their twitching genes uh, to their offspring. If we look at bacteria, um, starting at the left, in a normal population variation already exists. Remember that's one of the th observations that Darwin made, is that when you look at offspring, within that population, variation already exists. So in this population, we already have variation. We have one bacterium that is resistant and all the rest are not. You take the antibiotics, you can see there the antibiotics kill all but two. Uh, they kill all the ordinary ones. They leave the one that is resistant and they leave one other normal bacteria. The resistant bacteria obviously multiply as well as the normal bacteria, but the resistant bacteria do better and then when you apply another um, antibiotic, or even just over time, the normal bacteria will die out, leaving only a resistant strain. That is the way in which TB has evolved. So from normal TB, we now have moderately, moderately drug-resistant TB, MDR. We have um, TDR, to, uh, sorry, XDR, extremely drug-resistant, and we have TDR, totally drug-resistant TB. If you get TDR TB, essentially you get put into isolation and they wait for you to die. Because at present we do not have a drug that is able to treat that TB and your immune system is unlikely to be able to fight it off. And so it's pretty much a death sentence if you get TDR um, TB. For both moder moderately and extremely drug resistant, the treatment for both of those is a concoction of a variety of antibiotics. Uh, moderately drug resistant. You have to take your antibiotics for about two years um, and extremely drug resistant. I think it's about a five or a six year course of antibiotics that you have to take. And with um, 
XDR, they will tend to put you into isolation as well. Not Obviously, they don't want you spreading that to, to other people, but also to prevent you getting any secondary infections. Um, I'm sure you're aware that with ordinary TB, if you think back uh, to grade 11 and when we did this section in grade 11, with ordinary TB, your antibiotic course is usually about six months. 